so thank you very much for staying so late. I, I know it's been a long day. Um, Sig and I will talk about several good ways of um, measuring whether we have quality or not. I, I think that's quite an important topic, especially for large and complicated situations, because most of what people do when they measure quality is totally ridiculous. And hopefully, um, what we'll talk about today will inspire you to um, try out some new things and, and look at this from a slightly different perspective. Yes, and the, uh, the origin of this talk, I want to give some background here. Um, yeah, we have plenty of time, just a few minutes. <laughs> yeah, so I was, I've been doing a lot of work within the quality space, and uh, a couple of years back, I picked up this thing that Goiko created, ran with it, and then I asked Goiko to get some feedback on what, what can I do next, what can I do next, and he was like, we should do a talk on this. So here we are. And... Um, we're going to talk about tangible software quality. We will start by introducing ourselves a little bit. You all know Goiko. This is me. I currently work for IKEA. I do the uh, part of the uh, IKEA planning experiences. So if you plan your kitchen or your wardrobe, that's uh, kind of my department. I used to work for uh, events yeah, for e-commerce. I uh, did um, dev tools at Atlassian a couple of years. And I worked for JWay in Sweden as well as consultant. And I also have been part of a conference called Eurodev. That's where I met Goiko the first time. In 2009, we had this call for papers and, and this strange Serbian guy submitted. And I was like, well, I need to Google this guy. But it sounds interesting. I'll, I invite him for the talk for a conference. And, and then, yeah, he's been coming back ever since. I'm jo uh, originally Icelandic. And I uh, work in Sweden and lived in Sweden for most of my life. Goiko. Yeah, I'm, I'm Goiko. I have not worked for any of the companies that Sige <laughs> mentioned. In generally, I just don't like to work. So that, that's, uh, that's me. I guess we can start with the talk then. I don't like to work. So. He's, he's not that yeah. good at following mm. rules. Okay. Anyway, let's, let's start off with a little bit of interaction. So we prepped this question for you. And because we're going to talk about quality, we, everyone thinks about bugs, right? You know, should we, should we uh, do zero bugs? Uh, how many bugs count? So we're going to ask you this. So pull out your phones and go to this Insta poll here. Scan the QR code. And the question is, which one of these cases would you ship to production? So would you ship this uh, product that had 10,000 bugs in 10,000 lines of code, one bug in 10,000 lines of code, or zero bugs in 10,000 lines of code? It's quite a clear question, right? So please go to this poll, answer, and I'm going to look at some of the answers here. Uh, refresh. So we got, they're coming in. One bug in 10,000 lines of code, 15 votes. Ah, oh, 13 votes on zero bugs. Um, so should, should, you, should, maybe I'll, let's ask a few people what, <laughs> what they mean by this. So yeah. kind of, who voted for like 10,000 bugs in 10,000 lines of code? Why would you, why, why would you ship that to production? Victor. Just shout out. Okay, so you would waste too much time getting into the one bug, that's why just ship it and, you know, let, let it die in production or explode or whatever. So <laughs> we have another person over there, so why, why would you ship this one? You yeah, will get 10,000 feedbacks very quickly. So, <laughs> excellent. Because it's a miracle, it compiles. Oh, okay, it's compiles. a miracle, it compiles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> okay, yeah, so that, that's also, so, so, so how about kind of one bug, one bug in 10,000 lines of code? Who, who, who picked that? Who picked that, so? Yeah, well, at least you have something that you can fix. Ah, okay, <laughs> Something okay. you can fix, So we have right? something we can fix. If there's nothing we can fix, we wouldn't, we wouldn't ship that. Anybody else? Who selected one bug? 
Yeah? Too good, Talk, to too good to be true, so we don't trust <laughs> this one, okay? Um, and uh, kind of 13 people who would ship something that was not tested at all. Um. There you go. You save time, right? <laughs> you save time. Who, who said, who would ship that? No uh, one. No one wants to admit no that. No one. Okay, <laughs> now, now I'm embarrassed people. Good. So, so... Um, well, one of the things that's really interesting, if we look at measurements, is, is measurements are kind of really tricky from, from lots of different perspectives. There's a wonderful book, wonderful book, by Doug Hubbard called How to Measure Anything. Doug, uh, I mean, the, the title of the book sounds a bit ridiculous, but it's a very smart book. It's a book about business metrics, not necessarily software metrics. And Doug talks in the book how, um, especially in IT, uh, uh, stuff that people tend to measure has almost, is almost inversely proportional uh, to kind of how valuable it is. And he talks about how people usually tend to measure things that are easy to measure, not things that are important. Um, and bugs are one of these things that's relatively easy to measure. And, and that's why we kind of keep measuring that. Story points, uh, similarly, very easy to measure. Um, and, and people lose kind of the context of whether what we're measuring is at all important or not. Um, there's like uh, lots of complicated stuff about metrics, but let's, over, let's oversimplify this for the moment. Let's say that there's two types of, fundamentally two types of metrics. There's a type of metric that tells you that something is good tells you that you're achieving what you want to achieve, uh, or you're at least going in the right direction. I, I, I like to call these things value metrics. And there's a type of metric that tells you that something's bad, um, that there's a problem somewhere, and, and these are typically diagnostic metrics. The thing with diagnostic metrics that, that is useful is um, sometimes value metrics are really tricky and, and really expensive and really difficult to measure. So people tend to use diagnostic metrics that are cheap and quick to look for typical problems. Um, a thermometer measuring your temperature is a diagnostic metric. If, if you have a very high temperature or a very low temperature, you, you kind of, there's a problem. It doesn't say exactly what problem it is, but it's a cheap and easy thing you can do at home before going to a doctor to get a proper checkup. Um, and, and optimizing diagnostic metrics is, is, is dangerous because we might be wasting a stupid amount of time doing things that we shouldn't be doing. We, we might be strangling our product development because we are chasing zero bugs or something like that. Um, where really we, what we need to think about is um, are we detecting things that are valuable or are we kind of detecting common problems? And, and kind of a, a, a large number of bugs tells us something useful. A large number of bugs tells us this thing is horrible. A small number of bugs doesn't tell us anything useful. It doesn't say this thing is good. It's just saying it's not shit. Um, it's like saying, you know, th 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 there is no poison in that bottle. Brilliant, but is the bottle empty? But don't know. Is, is, does it contain something that's tasty? I don't know. Does it like, you know, so, so it's just saying there's no poison in the bottle. And, and so we need to start thinking about this from a slightly different perspective. And, and like the first rule that um, kind of we, we really want to talk about when we think about measuring quality is that we can't prove the presence of something by measuring the absence of something else. We can just prove the absence of something else. And uh, if we're thinking about quality, this is kind of the problem where, where it's very easy for people to say when there's no quality or when there's low quality. It's much easier for people to complain than to say, oh, this is good. Because it's, it's, it's difficult and expensive to measure what's good. Now, one of the kind of things that you're going to face is somebody's going to say it's impossible. Um, and I, I, I have this kind of mental trick I've learned from a, a, a friend, business analyst. Wherever people say it's impossible, try to rephrase it, it's, it's too expensive. 
It's not necessarily impossible. I mean, we, we, we're not talking about aliens. We're not talking about kind of, uh, you know, building some new type of nuclear reactor that is going to magically create perpetual mobile or infinite energy. We're talking about our software. We, 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 we're kind of, you know, it, it, we are building it. It should be possible to define quality. It just might be too expensive. And then we can look at what is the expensiveness of this and how do we, how do we manage that expensiveness. So kind of generally um, uh, kind of first really important thing to remember is uh, measuring the absence of, of quality is not proving that we have quality. And we have to figure out how do we prove that. Yes. And um, another point that we're going to touch upon is what type of quality we're after. Um, so when I say what type of quality, you may think, what is this guy saying? And I'm going to give you these, this example. These are index cards that I created. Um, there is this long list of illities, um, testability, portability, uh, usability, maintainability, accessibility, et cetera, et cetera, right? So there are like 140 of them. And this list was created by James Park and refined a little bit by a group called the Test Eye. And it highlights how many things that we could care about. It doesn't necessarily help us with what should we care about. And that's a tricky question, and so we need to work with that. Um, so I did this um, in a project a couple of uh, years ago. Um, I was uh, working as a consultant for this uh, startup. And this startup founder, the only thing that he had heard from his startup founder, you know, buddies was performance, performance, performance. Performance is really the thing that you need to be able to scale, right? Ever heard of that? Well, you need to scale, but then you need to think about what other things matter as well. So. Um, I took out these index cards and uh, we went through them and, and talked about what they matter, uh, what they um, meant. And then we did like a 2020 vision type of prioritization activity. Um, and so the product he was uh, wanting us to build was, was this kind of data indexing search engine for internal use in companies. This is 10 years ago, so it's a long time ago. That startup didn't make it. Anyway, what he n knew at the time was that he was going to uh, index a bunch of corporate data for people. And so when we came to the you know, comparison of performance and data integrity, data integrity meaning not tampering with your source data, you may see where, where, where this is getting. <laughs> data integrity was more important than the performance that he was looking for, but it was not obvious to him. It was not obvious to, until we had had the discussion, and um, it, he suddenly he, he did realize that that meant that this performance thing being less important than data integrity would, would affect how we build the system. So basically, we, we had a good architectural outcome out of that discussion. Another project that I was on, um, we were building this build system. Um, and so if you, if you think about a build system for developers, you, you, you want, you're, you're doing you know, something in the build, and then you report it back a result. Obviously, developer time is really expensive, so making sure that the results come back to the developer as fast as possible is crucial, right? We also need those results to be reliable, right? Because we cannot have, you know, results being flaky from, you know, from the system, right, itself. Um, but then we were building this feature of a summarizing page. So a summary page of your builds is something that you look at at a glance to see do we have any trending, what, what builds failed, you know, past times, etc. right? Is that as, it, it, does that need to be as fast? We realize that it is enough that we are eventually consistent for the summary page to show the appropriate results but we, we need fast and reliable direct feedback on that 
last one, right? So basically, thinking about this problem and how we could build this other feature, because that affected the architecture of this whole system. That's you. So I guess, the, the, yeah, the, 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 the really what um, we're getting to is that uh, thinking about quality as a single thing is, in, is pointless. That there's multiple different aspects to this and we need to accept that. And instead of measuring quality, we need to start thinking about measuring qualities and, and defining what these qualities are. And, and Sigi showed you kind of a bunch of cards and um, what I like about that is you can start kind of prompting yourself to think about, well, what, what, what are the different aspects of this product that are really important? And you might kind of be surprised by, by what you find out when you start looking at it. For example, you know, you, you have thinking about an accounting software system, you would say like accuracy is really important, but is it important that the accounting software is beautiful? Probably not, unless you want to make a lot of money, like zero. So zero is kind of one of the most popular accounting packages in the world now, and when they started, their whole thing was beautiful accounting software. That was their thing. That, that's what they were selling. They were selling beauty kind of in, in, in something that was traditionally ugly and horrible and, and, and kind of difficult to work with. And that's how they became one of the kind of biggest accounting software companies in the world. Because they understood what, what, you know, yes, it needs to be accurate, but it needs to be beautiful as well. So, kind of, we have all these different aspects that we might want to look at. We, you know, some of them are like accurate and performant. Like how performant? You know, does it need to be eventually consistent? Does it need to be completely consistent? Another really nice example of these things are kind of video games. Um, video games need to be fun. Video games don't necessarily have to have a low number of bugs. In fact, people will kind of very often um, suffer the bugs because the game is fun. There are kind of forums out there where people exchange tricks like, oh, if you press this stone, the game kind of falls apart, so don't do that. Or if you lift this stone, there's a bug and you get some money and, and you know, do that. And as long as the game is fun, uh, people will play it regardless of the bugs. If the game is not fun, having no bugs is not going to save it. I mean, there's a famous case from, from Civilization. Civilization is one of these kind of world-building games that I, I, I used to play as a kid. Uh, the, the first Civilization game had an 8-bit uh, aggression uh, level, uh, aggression kind of parameter for world leaders. Different world leaders start with different levels of aggression. Genghis Khan starts at like very high. Um, I don't know. Uh, Julius Caesar starts with high. Gandhi starts very low. And, and um, kind of over time, their aggression level changes. Uh, kind of Julius Caesar becomes more aggressive. Gandhi becomes even less aggressive. He becomes more peaceful. At some point, around 1800 something, just at a time where, you know, theoretically in the game you can start developing nukes, Gandhi goes into minus one and becomes like incredibly aggressive and starts nuking everybody. And uh, th this is an obvious bug. It's an obvious bug, but it was a bug that was so interesting and so nice that they've kind of kept reproducing it in, in modern versions of the game because it became a feature. So it's kind of, um, th th it's, it, what I'm trying to say is that there's all these different aspects and we need to start looking at measuring different aspects of this stuff. And um, it's impossible to define a single quality. And so with, many different qualities, um, you might end up with questions like this. Um, so this build system, we need to be fast and reliable. It can be eventually consistent, but what is eventually enough? So how quickly can we accept that this summary page does not load, right? And this is where we need to think about who, who makes these types of decisions. Um, is it the tester that is going to test for this thing? Is it the developer that defines what is enough? Um, and, and it actually becomes a really important thing that this is going to be defining uh, the product and the, 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 uh, it needs to be you know, um, helped with maybe user research, what is acceptable and things like that. And so, basically, defining what type of quality that you want to strive for 
is essentially a product level decision and a product level decision that you may need to gather your stakeholders and, and everyone involved to think about what is acceptable, what do we need to want, what do we strive for, what can we make. So basically it becomes a whole team effort on, on defining what this means and essentially it, it's a decision about how, where do we want to invest our time and money. In, into this product. And one of, one of the key things with that is um, all these attributes exist and, and we, you know, we might want to improve all these attributes but we don't have an infinite amount of time. The software, you know, releasing the software has value sooner rather than later. And, and the question becomes, what's the right trade-off here? What are the, what are, you know, how much do we delay releasing the software to raise these different things? How do we, in which ones of these do, do we invest and how much and where? And people start arguing about that because there's very often almost no shared understanding of that. I, I, I had this really, really bizarre consulting engagement a while ago. Um, this was before the cloud, this was before you could buy like data grids and synchronization of the shelf. So um, we had this thing where um, uh, a, a client um, hired me to check if the development organization that was working with them was lying to them and scamming them. I'm like, well, that sounds like a really weird thing. How can I know that? I said, well, you know, they, they, told, they, they quoted them uh, several million pounds to develop the first version of the application. And then it was delivered, and then they just wanted a tiny change, and the development organization quoted them like almost double the development effort for the original version. It's like, what, what are we doing here? And um, kind of, so I s said like, I don't understand any of this, I don't know the context, but I can go in and I can talk to them, I can talk to you, I can figure out maybe what's going on and try to translate between the, the two groups. So they were doing some kind of uh, aggregating data analytics uh, for advertising online. And this was kind of like an affiliate system. So the company was allowing other uh, small businesses to put ads on their websites and then giving them a share of the revenue from the sales. Um, so um, the, the, everything was built, everything was okay, and then uh, the client had only one tiny requirement change. They wanted to have real-time reports. And the development organization basically said, well, you know, this is like a totally re complete rewrite of the whole thing. It's a totally different architecture. It's not a single centralized database. We need to have like data collectors all over the world. We need to have like data grids were not commercially available then. They needed to develop a data grid. They needed to do conflict resolution. They needed to kind of distribute data. It's like totally different system architecturally. Yes, you will still have your kind of, you know, business report at the end, but... So, um, and, and uh, I, you know, I spoke to these people, went back to the client, said, look, you know, th this is a rewrite. This is like, but maybe we don't have to like spend all of it up front. Like how, you know, can, what is, what is the current time you're generating this report in? What, what are these reports at all? He said, well, these are reports for people that are putting ads on their websites because they need to know how the ads are performing so they can kind of change or improve the positions, improve the banners, get more money, and then we get more money. And he said, okay, but how frequently are they running now? They're running once a month. Okay, so, I mean, what if we don't do it once a month? What if we do it once a week? And I said, no, 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 we can't do it once a week because like all our competitors are doing it once a week. That's the reason why we want real time. We want to be much better than the competition. And I said, okay, um, so what if like we do it once a day? And the guy who I was speaking to said to me, yes, real time, that's what I'm asking. <laughs> so instead of this kind of data grid that's rewritten and, you know, inventing the whole inventing cloud before cloud existed, kind of all we had to do was slightly optimize the database job so it can run overnight. And they were better than the competition. So th this is kind of, um, uh, again, figuring out what the right trade-offs are is, is really, really important. And, and we need to have a model that helps people do this more systematically. So you don't have to kind of invite somebody to come and, and, and talk to people for two weeks and figure this thing out. And there's, there's one really good model that was actually invented by Sigis University professor that I think we should talk about. 
Yeah, and 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 this the story about you know how he presented it. So basically, this conference that I invited Goiko to in two thousand nine, I had also invited my professor beha- because he had some of these stuff, um, you know, in his academic papers. And I was like, that that we let's let's have that to the conference. And sitting there listening to Bjorn Bjorn Regnell, um on the first row, and I was sitting next to Goiko and looking at this model that my professor showed, it was like over my head. I did not understand what he was talking about. I was new in the industry. It didn't make sense to me then. It has actually come to me later. But instead, next to me, this guy is sitting there. This is so excellent. This is great. He even blogged about it the day after. And I was like, I still don't get it. <laughs> and that's the model that Goiko is going to um, so walk yeah, you through, the, Cooper model. The, the model is called Cooper. It comes from Ericsson. Uh, and it's, Cooper is, is short for quality performance. So how are we achieving quality? What's our performance on quality? Um, and, and basically, there, there's two ways of looking at this model. There's kind of this thing that Sige says it's, it's impossible to understand because it's very academic, it's like difficult graphs and things like that. But there's an oversimplification of the model for people who are stupid like me that can't understand kind of really complicated academic stuff. And basically the model says um, to figure out the performance of and, and even expected performance of the thing, we need to have shared understanding of stakeholders not just kind of, you know, somebody, mid-level management in, product person in an organization. And stakeholders are not going to agree because everybody wants different things. But we can anchor the discussion. We can provide something that's objective, that doesn't depend on anybody in the room, and then have a good agreement. And, and what we need to provide, uh, according to the model, are three data points. And these three data points are really interesting because they do not depend on you. They do not depend on your software at all. They depend on the market expectations, and the market expectations are basically driven by your competitors and your users and things like that. So you can do some research, figure out what these things are. And there's three points for for every kind of aspect of quality. Um, The first point is the utility point. This is the point below which the solution does not apply to the market at the moment. So if all our competitors can generate a report for users in one week, Doing something in a month makes, us product, makes our product obsolete. We need to be kind of at least 10 days or, or one week. The other point is the differentiation point. The differentiation point is the point at which people start buying the product or using the product because you're so much better than the competition. If everybody can generate it, most of our competitors can do things in one week, but we can do it in one day our product becomes so much better that people will select our product. Uh, Kent McDonald in Stand Back and Deliver calls this point the billboard test. He says, this is the point where salespeople would buy an ad for this and put it on a billboard to advertise it because that's so notable that it's good. And then the third point uh, in the model is the saturation point. This is the point above which the market is not ready for the improvement. Uh, people doing those ads, they need to design a banner. They need to update their website. They need to kind of put things there. So, so before chat GPT and DALI and things like that, they would have to send stuff to an external designer anyway. It takes a day. So doing the reports every hour is pointless. They cannot react to it. But then these things again change over time. Now we have DALI and things like that. Maybe we are going into a faster cycle. So these three points are basically for every, every aspect of quality, we can define these three points that are expectations of the market. And then we can say, where are we now? Are we here? And where do we need to be? Again, you know, for, for uh, zero, the beautiful accounting software, how beautiful does beautiful need to be? Is it enough to be kind of here? Or is it, does it have to go all, over, all the way over there? In release one, should it be here, release two, release three? Where does it need to be? And then we can figure out the trade-offs of these things. Usually kind of, you know, for some features, you never need to go above the differentiation point. You just need to be above utility. For some features that you're really selling, you need to be here. And, and no, not features, characteristics of your software. So this is a really good way of getting stakeholders to start trying to agree at least on, on, on the ranges of things where to be. Um, but again, it's, it's not the only model that is useful for prompting. So, 
There's one other, uh, another model that um, is the reason for this talk. Um, the model was created by Goico in 2012. Um, it is the software quality pyramid based off of Maslow Pyramid of Needs. So you know, the, the one that speaks about which levels that you as a person needs to go up to self-actualization. And he created this pyramid uh, for, for software and software quality. Um, and the reason I, I took this and, and ran with it with my teams is because I was trying to figure out how do I quantify quality? What are we after? What, keeping, cre creating this discussion with my team. Um, so basically it's space of mass pyramid of needs and the most basic uh, fundamentals of software quality is that it's deployable and functionally okay. Basically it runs somewhere and does something. It's quite basic, right? And then, and then you need to build your software so that it, it satisfies these needs just enough. And when you've justified it just enough, reached just enough of this level, it's kind of wasteful to you know, keep doing that until you uh, uh, reach upwards. So you basically want to uh, reach upwards to this pyramid and, and think about performance and security. So fast enough to use, secure enough to use. Um, and when I talk to uh, people, traditional testers or traditional that are more working a little bit more traditionally, especially testers, these are the t uh, the the levels kind of where they are testing. The more mature testers go for performance and security testing, but very few reach upwards. So, in the middle, you got usableness. Usableness, as in. The, the software, the product that we have can be used by users and gives some value. Um, so can be used, that can be evaluated with usability testing and, and user testing, etc. cetera. Um, and then the next level up, usefulness. Does the product that we have satisfy those customers' needs so that they re can reach their goals? And, and, and give them the value that they wanted out of the product. And now you may think that that would be the top level, but successfulness in this case, for any software that you build, usually in, you know, in, in companies, you, you have a goal with that software in terms of money, revenue, Monthly active users, things like that. The, the utmost successfulness metrics of your software products. So you basically want to reach for the top, but, but have the fundamentals with you on the way. And so taking this model, um, and, and last time I, I, I applied this is now that I am at IKEA. So this is an example. I know that this is a lot of text, and I'm gonna, not going to read through it all, but I want to highlight a couple of them. Basically, on the, on the bottom level, for, for the products that I work with, we, we, we do these online and in-store in kiosk uh, planning uh, experiences. So basically, if you, if you plan your wardrobe and then you can uh, get it to your phone, a shopping list, and then you can add it to cart and, and, and things like that. So basically, that, those are the products that I work with. And so on the bottom level, we may talk about like failures and bugs, reliability, availability. So the basic, Dora metrics, just to, to, as a basic level of we keep track of these and they are diagnostic metrics for us when it comes to these <laughs> very fundamental things that it runs somewhere. Uh, the monitor error rates or defects reported versus deployed features, things like that. On the next levels, I mean, fast enough. How fast is fast enough on the web? Well, we have the you know, standard ways of measuring performance on the web, Google Web Vitals. You can also start thinking about, uh, is that enough for us, or do we need to care about perceived performance? So I, um, when I was in e-commerce, um, we were selling kind of a, a shelf product uh, that we've de de developed and that we integrated uh, with ERP systems and stuff, and we sold performance. Now, every time we would launch a site, 
Uh, there was this uh, e-commerce magazine that would send pingdom requests to our site and say, you're not fast. Well, actually, with the fastnet that we were <laughs> delivering was actually all but first request. Because first request was done, get the site, and then optimistically loading in the background, meaning that the customer experienced fastness because we had already loaded some of the stuff in the categories and product pages that they were looking for next, right? So it doesn't have to be only Google Web Vitals for performance. Now, going up a level, so we are measuring engaged rates versus bounce rates in the, in the, in the planning experiences. So to see how many users are, are, are actually you know, interacting and things like that. Um, we've also defined some interaction moments. So make it me, um, what is me, et cetera, right? So basically the type of interaction moments to, to define if, if the customer fa found the product useful. On the next step, we, we're talking about customers' goals achievement and coworker goals achievement. Do we help um, customers buy furniture? Um, we can t uh, think about the conversion moments, obviously, but also the um, the, the time. No, that's uh, that one. Um, so, for example, if you save a design and then do you open it again? And then on the top level, we talk about the, the revenue, obviously. Like, do we contribute to the business? Um, but also, for example, we update the range uh, regularly. So do we support the business well enough in those range updates? So by, by quantifying or, or pinpointing which areas that I want my teams to care about, uh, we have really much more mature discussions on what types of quality do they need to focus on uh, at the moment. Because all the, all the different product teams uh, for the planners are in different places in the life cycle, and they are different, uh, differently mature, etc. So basically, um, this is the framework on which we talk about what type of quality and what, what are we working towards. Basically, and what we all want to strive for is this good slice of the pyramid because we don't want to be focusing here. We want to aim that way. And and when I get to this point where I describe this to my teams, um, some of them are like, "Yeah, we're measuring most of it," and then now we're trying to optimize he up here. And I'm like, "Do you know what parts on the bottom that affect the top?" Can we improve successfulness by improving performance? And that's where we get into the more, even more mature discussions. So basically, um, we get to uh, quality rule, tangible quality rule number three, uh, shaping the quality priorities narrative uh, with some kind of model so that we can discuss around what quality we're after. And, and you know, Sigi showed one model. Um, that model works for him and, and it worked for some of my clients, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for you, but kind of the, the key message here is like you need to create your own model. How you, you know, what the trade-offs are, what the priorities are and things like that. So just to kind of reinforce the message that you don't need to use this model, I want to show you another model that I, I use for um, a product of mine now. And um, it comes from Google. Google, uh, it's described really well in a book called How Google Tests Software. And it's called the Attribute Component Capability Matrix. That's their way of kind of modeling uh, quality and risk and, and figuring out how much testing and where they want to direct testing. Um, the, um, uh, uh, at least according to the book, um, it's a key part of figuring out the testing strategy for Android. It's a key part of figuring out the testing strategy for Google Maps and a bunch of other things there. And kind of the, the matrix itself, uh, as the name says, has uh, system attributes. System attributes are the things we care about. Fast, secure, profitable, um, accurate, beautiful, and things like that. That's on the top. Then it has system components, um, kind of that's the vertical. And then kind of the theory that this is based on is that you can't kind of say how much risk is there to break a component in isolation. What you can talk about is how much risk is there to disrupt a user capability. 
So if we have a software for accountants, disrupting the capability to calculate a VAT report has a certain amount of risk. Disrupting the capability to log in has a certain amount of risk. So disrupting the ability to, I don't know, uh, customize the columns on a report has a certain amount of risk. And at Google, they use like 20 different levels of risk. Um, for my product, kind of because I'm stupid and I can't deal with 20 things, we've narrowed it down to three. And then you can kind of figure out, well, for this capability, which kind of, which of the important things does it belong to? Which component does it kind of belong to? And then you put these things into the, the kind of matrix. And then you figure out the maximum level of risk for these things. And then you can say, well, if we are changing something around this component, what are the potential capabilities we are disrupting? How much testing do we want to do over what and, and, and things like that? And, and this is where um, uh, um, we start thinking about um, the, the different policies. For example, for, for this product that I'm building, we have three levels. Level three is stuff that's horrible, 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 horrible level of risk. Um, and that basically means that before every release, even if we have not touched this component, and all the automated tests pass, we are going to do manual exploratory testing on it to prove that we've not missed something. Things like payments, things like logging in, that kind of, if it was disrupted, things break completely. Level two, where kind of, um, we would run all the automated tests, but and if we're changing that component, we'll do some exploratory testing on that. Testing on that. If we're not changing that component, we'll not. Level one, um, we are not going to explore it we will accept kind of that, you know, we, we might have missed something. And uh, you, you can create different policies of how much testing and how much investigation, how much de-risking you want to prove. And this goes back to kind of a really interesting uh, uh, kind of statement. I, 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 there's another book I'd like to recommend. It's called Four Disciplines of Execution. And in Four Disciplines of Execution, they talk about what do organizations that are really successful in, in delivering do from differently from organizations they don't. And um, I really like the terminology they're using. And, and one of the statements they have is kind of, if you're not keeping score, you're not really competing, you're just practicing. So are you, are you competing with your product or are you practicing software de development? That's kind of an interesting thing to ask. And how would we even know that you know, we, are, we are delivering quality or not? Are we keeping score or not? And uh, an ACC matrix allows us to keep score around software quality. Um, the, the way kind of how it can be used is you used kind of, this is a, a, a visualization you can create with something like that. It's kind of how, what's the risk we are carrying for a particular time span, time, time slice of the you know, development. And um, this is kind of the maximum amount of risk in that uh, area of the matrix. The more we do testing, the more it fills up. And what you can say is, you know, once we've kind of no longer carrying anything at risk level, this, we can release. And this is an agreement between the business, the technology, and, and kind of it's, I, I, we can start thinking about testing activities as an insurance policy against horrible things happening in production. And we can start thinking about this uh, as, as um, kind of with an insurance policy, you have two things. If you buy an insurance policy, um, you have the price of the premium and you have the excess you want to accept. Um, and, and I think testing activities for me are very similar to that. Uh, we, we can delay the release of the software, we can delay time to market uh, for, in order to do testing. And that's the price we pay every release. That's your, that's your monthly premium on the insurance policy. And, and you, when you buy a policy for a car, you can buy a policy that kind of protects you, but doesn't protect you against damages that are kind of less than 100 euros. And you get a cheaper premium. From the same perspective here, we can agree with the business, time to market is important. The time to market has value. And, and, and kind of, we can achieve faster time to market by accepting more risk, or we can accept less risk by achieving slower time to market. And, and this is kind of at Google and, and kind of for the product time building, we, we use this model to drive the discussion to agree on what level of risk is acceptable. And, and when people say, oh, no, no risk is acceptable, but that's insane because we don't have an infinite amount of time to develop software. The time to market is, you know, important. We need to release at some point. Let's make sure that we are releasing it when we have a reasonable amount of risk. 
So kind of the um, uh, last kind of um, really important thing, uh, or not, not last, but kind of the, the next really important thing is we can make this thing tangible by kind of uh, visualizing the model. And by visualizing the model, we are giving people decision-making tools. That's another thing they talk about in, in four disciplines of execution. By visualizing and publishing this data, we are distributing decision-making. People in different teams can figure out what level of risk they're doing. They can do stuff on their own. We don't have to kind of have a big centralizing session every time there's something going on. Everybody can make their own decisions better. And the really important thing is lots of people kind of collect lots and lots of metrics, but they don't act on them. If you never act on a metric, just stop tracking it. It's pointless. So we need to figure out when we track, when we act on this. And in, in, in four disciplines of execution, they call this thing create a cadence of accountability, review the metrics you're doing, and kind of actually do something about the, 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 the stuff there. And um, w obviously, the signals that you want to act on is not just the you know alerting and monitoring, but also the signals of the visualizing of your dashboard and seeing that there is something red in an area that we don't want red. And there, we we're gonna finish off with another model, obviously. Um, this model could be a talk in itself, but it's about my next step in discussing with my teams on where do we want to invest time and money when it comes to test automation, for example. So basically, the, the signals that we want to act on may be test automation failing, but it may also be alerting and monitoring that will give us a hunch of if something is worthy for production or not. Um, and so there's this uh, model is based, well, it's, it's another pyramid plus another pyramid on top. Basically, this is the test automation pyramid with you know small unit tests, medium integration tests, large system tests, and UI tests, and then this cloud that is kind of famous. Uh, but on the top, I've added, or uh, this is, I did with a coworker of mine uh, at a previous job, we added the top pyramid of health checks, being health checks that would run mid-deployment, both to test environments and production environments, that would do some health checks and sometimes some synthetic checks as well before we got traffic onto the uh, uh, environment. And then we have the alerting, monitoring, and logging. And basically <laughs> framing the discussion on what type of qualities are we after mostly? Which risks do we want to care about before deployment to production? Which risks are okay that we get signals from production from our users? Because certain things you, you don't necessarily care about uh, you know, until uh, it hit a person. So one example is, you know, from our planners that, that I've actually started to discuss with some of our product owners is, is basically our range is a multi-dimensional thing. We cannot test at all everything because there's so many dimensions in that matrix. And so we've actually started defining how can we monitor for range issues. Basically, it's okay that one customer would hit it, but it's not, but, but not more than one. And how can we act quickly on those signals from production because we cannot possibly test everything. And so basically, when do we want to uh, capture risks? Um, where do we want to catch them and what are we after? And, and obviously, the, you know, the upper part of logging, we will be looking for unknown unknowns that it, we cannot really automate or create automation testing for anyway. Because if you don't know what you're looking for, you don't know what to test, right? So, so basically, as a final note, another way of, of, of looking at uh, software development quality with a model, uh, and this may or may not become a talk in the future. Um, this is basically the summary slide of, of the rules that we've uh, talked about. Ba basically, to make quality tangible, we measure presence and not absence. Uh, we describe multiple qualities instead of quality. Trade-offs are a product-level decision. Um, you shape the priorities with a model, and then you visualize and act on those uh, risks that you have. Thank you so much. Thank you.